I'm Carlin Lillington, and our Wald Culture guest today is Dr. Owen O'Dell, who is Associate Professor of Law at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Dr. O'Dell's academic teaching and research interests are in contract, restitution, freedom of expression, media, IT, and cyber law, and intellectual property law, where he has a special interest in copyright. In 2011, the Irish government appointed him to chair the Copyright Review Committee, an expert committee tasked with making recommendations for an overhaul of Irish copyright law. Two years later, in 2013, the committee produced an influential report, Modernizing Copyright, and that report in turn helped shape changes to Ireland's copyright law in 2019, just in time for the EU to pass a new copyright directive that would require additional changes. So if you're confused, we'll get Owen to sort this out for us. Welcome to Wald Culture, Owen. Thank you very much, Carlin. I'm thrilled to be here. A good place to start might be to start at the very beginning with some copyright basics. Can you explain what is copyright and why do we need it or do we need it? Well, copyright is a right that you get in an original work. Now, original means you've done the work yourself. It's your own intellectual creation. It doesn't mean that you're Shakespeare. I mean, there's only one Shakespeare. Uh, but it does mean that you've done the work yourself. And if you have done the work yourself, then copyright gives you the right to decide whether to copyright, sorry, whether to copy something, whether to publish something, whether to adapt something, whether to sell those rights to other people, whether to allow or to prevent those things from happening. Um, and if you choose to do those in a in a monetized way, you can sell the rights or license the rights to a, a content company, or you can choose to just put things out online or uh, publish as you wish um, uh, for yourself. Um, and copyright lasts for a specific period of time, uh, usually the life of the author plus 70 years. And after that, even if you have exercised your copyright rights to the fullest, uh, the work goes into the public domain, which is why we can have so many adaptations of Shakespeare, because if he were in copyright, he's dead a long time. Uh, so he is definitely now out of copyright. And the balance here is this. You get to choose. You have the right to decide whether somebody else copies or not. And you get to choose whether to monetize um, and there are industries out there that monetize the copyright and sell the copyright and make money out of the copyright. Um, and there are cultural benefits from that. But uh, although the law rewards or incentivizes your production, it does say that in the end there are limits uh, because other people should be able to take advantage of that too. So copyright is the right to make a decision about your intellectual work. That decision can be let everybody have it, know it's mine, oh, I'll, I'll sell it, whatever, and it eventually comes to an end. Can you give us a bit of the um, copyright's legal history? Because that the terms that we have today and the way... Um, and the way we view it, the way we think about copyright hasn't really always been exactly the same. Where where did the sense of a right to, to be able to uh, claim a copyright to a work um, or um, an idea, where, where did that be emerge? And then how has it changed um, over time to where we are right now? The, the the intellectual origins, whether in the UK, Ireland, the US on the one hand, or uh, continental Europe on the other, both go back to about the 1600s, at a time when the crown in the UK, in France, gave monopolies to printers. And that began the idea that a copyright is effectively a monopoly. And then in the 1700s, the intellectual move was to give that monopoly not to the printers as printers, but to the author. 
And that's where we now have the idea of the copyright vesting in the author, vesting in the starving artist in the garret, verse, uh, vesting in the, uh, the scribbler in the coffee house, ver- vesting in the, um, now the, uh, musician in the garage. Um, uh, it's the 17, 1710s, uh, is when we begin to see that legislative protection. Um, and that was originally for seven years, renewable for another seven. And, for a very long time, copyright terms were extended, um, but in multiples of seven. So 14, 28, uh, and then went to life, life plus 50, life plus 70. Um, so what you can see is two moves, one including the author and then extending the copyright uh, protection period. Um, and the, the, the high point of those moves in the US is 1976, which is the main copyright act in the US and 1998, which is the main term provision giving the life of the author to 70 years. And we see those moves, uh, from 1700 over time, uh, in, in the European Union as well, uh, lining up to, um, a big, European Union directive in 2000, which is the starting point of current EU copyright law. Could you talk about some of the shifts that happened as well um, with, you know, I'm thinking in particular about the the, the uh, notion around the world culture broad, uh, uh, podcast, which is really around this notion of when technology begins to collide with copyright terms and those extended copyright terms. And I was um, thinking as well that you, you have, it's, there's a bit of irony that copyright began with the printer, shifted to the, the artist now, the, or the, the person who originates a, an idea in any area as well. It could be, um, it can be a, a software technology development as well. Um, and then, you know, the, the idea became it should be me, the person creating the thing. And now it seems to have shifted back to this quite fraught area of the big corporations coming in, which we will yeah. we'll jump into as we discuss your role on the, the copyright uh, panel. But the um, what happened? How did this what happened that changed and, and and has made us rethink how we view copyright at this point? There has been an interconnection between content and technology from effectively the end of the Second World War. And it there there is uh the move between say nineteen fifty and two thousand is the move where um the monetization of copyright creating, if you like, copyright industries is around books, music, and movies. And at every stage, um, each incumbent, first of all, sees the next technology as a potentially infringing technology. Uh, so you've got books, but the photocopier allows the copying of books. Oh, my God. Then you've got um, music and movies, but the tape to tape deck allowed uh, copying of music uh, and then the VCR allowed copying of uh, of television um, and you can you can industrialize all of these things uh, and therefore it allowed the copying uh, on a larger scale so before the 1950s um, technology was uh, primarily about production um, from the 1950s technology was about copying and therefore potentially infringing. Uh, And what we have seen is the content industries limping a little, finally catching up with the technology um, and finding ways to continue the monetization of the technology. Um, And the first big copyright fight around things like um, Xerox machines, tape to tape machines, VCRs, uh, resulted in a U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1986 uh, between Universal Studios and Sony about whether the Betamax was encouraging infringement of copyright. And the Supreme Court ultimately said that uh, there is a general exception in the U.S. 1976 Act called Fair Use, uh, 
um, and that home taping in those circumstances, time shifting or format shifting as it has become, uh, was um, an example of that exception. The second big technological shift has been uh, since effectively 2000 with the rise of the internet and the even greater ease of copying um, uh, so that uh, uh, an individual copy uh, can be a perfect copy. That's the thing about a, a digital copy versus an analog copy. It can be a perfect copy. And that also has, has created um, other problems. Now, and I'll come back to them in a second. Hand in hand with the uh, the rise of home copying goes, or in, in, in advance of it, is the, the growth of the content industry. Um, there's an awful lot more content, whether it's more movies and cinemas, whether it's more music uh, that, that can be consumed by teenagers, whether it's more books and magazines and so on. So copyright fueled the growth of the industry. Um, and that as an industry, seeing copyright as a business model, has um, pushed to extend copyright in two significant ways. The first is in the kinds of things that can be protected by copyright or copyright-like uh, legal rights. So the original copyright was for things that were printed. Now, effectively, any cultural work, uh, any creative work is, is copyrightable or gets a different uh, similar protection, say databases have a special protection, for example, in the EU, uh, software has a special protection, but broadly speaking, uh, anything that is um, uh, original work will get a copyright or similar protection. And there has been a push to extend the period of copyright protection. Um, as I said, it started out as seven plus seven. It's now life of the author plus 17 years. The last big push to extend copyright uh, was uh, successful in 1998 in the US, where effectively legislation championed by Sonny Bono um, created an extended copyright for Mickey Mouse, um, so that Mickey Mouse has only just uh, recently dropped out of copyright protection. But um, uh, they, Mickey Mouse got an extra 20 years in 1998. Uh, and the uh, the US, whenever it negotiates uh, an international treaty covering uh, content services, um, pretty much insists on ensuring that the copyright term of the reciprocal state is extended in the same way, which is one of the reasons why the EU extended its copyright protection in 2000 and why Canada is about to extend its from life of the author plus 50 to life of the author plus 70. What are some of the pro uh, practical implications for those of us uh, who create and as well as for those of us who consume um, the small people as opposed to the big corporations? Because they're, uh, um, I wonder about the benefits the companies have received from these burgeoning technologies that they complain about. And yet at the same time, it's created new markets for them. Um, even like with home taping, obviously somebody sitting at home, suddenly there was a, a whole new industry of, of movie rentals. Now it would be um, streams from places like Netflix or Amazon yep. Prime. Um, I also, and you think about movie stream or uh, music streaming, where th there's these whole new markets for the companies that capitalize on the creative process. But we hear again and again about how the musicians say they're paid almost nothing for these streams. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about who's benefiting from these shifts in these extensions of copyright, which we're often told is to benefit the creator. Does it benefit the creator? Yep. Well, the benefit to the creator is the copyright creation myth. As I said already, the uh, the, the, the party who is said to benefit from um, copyright is the party who is creating the great cultural masterpiece in the attic or in the garage. Um, and uh, uh, that's not how it has worked out in practice. It benefits the uh, the content companies for us to believe that the the real advantages flow to the starving artist. Whereas, in fact, 
numbers around streams show that uh, by and large, the amount you get for a stream is very, very small. What that means is that the copyright industries benefit the copyright industry rather than the uh, the individual artist. Um, and uh, the monetization of copyright has created um, collecting societies, has created uh, copyright uh, content companies um, who are benefiting because it is a marketplace and they are the, the, the organization's best structure to benefit in the marketplace. As a consequence, some legislators are trying to rebalance slightly. It was, I mean, we, we all know the, the stories of the, the group that signs the, uh, the contract that sells their souls to the uh, music company and the music company then makes money out of them forever and they only Which ever get Which has been like the history fees. of music since 19 Absolutely, whatever, it's the you history know? of music. And since recorded you, music, you, you, you know. You'll find the actor who doesn't get residuals on the most famous movie ever. You'll find the scriptwriter who signed everything away to the agent. Uh, you, you'll find the musician, as you've just said, who's given everything to the music company. Um, so this, this is the, the counter trope, if you like, the reality. Um, and it's very easy for, uh, especially at the start of a career for a contract to sign everything away to license or even transfer all these rights to copy, to, to publish, to, to adapt and so on. Um, so legislation now is beginning, but only beginning to do two things. One is to say that you can't completely contract out of uh, any of your Copyright Act rights. Um, and even if you do transfer, uh, those kinds of rights, you don't lose uh, rights to fair remuneration. Now, we don't quite know yet what those two things mean, but they are attempted legislative responses, uh, which, um, uh, you know, that they, they are meeting a reality that uh, the copyright industries are industries and therefore are all about the players in the industry and not the original creators. Well, I'm eager to dive into some more of, about those specific legal contexts as we um talk about what happened in the EU and the Irish context with the work that you did on the commission and um, where we are now. Just before we jump there, I also wondered, could you just touch on what the impact of the current situation is for, say, me when I buy a digital book or a, a access to a stream? It's not quite the same as back in the day when I might buy a tape of music or a CD or when I go down to the bookstore and buy a print book. What are the impacts for us, the users? Back in the day when you bought a physical item like a book or a CD or a DVD, um, you owned the physical item, but on that item there was copyright content, the, the, the book you were reading, the text you were reading, the music you're listening to, the movie you were watching. Now you don't have the physical item. Uh, you just have the, the content that you're accessing. But even then, all you had was a limited right to access and consume the content. It just felt like you owned something because you owned the, the paper or the tape or the, or, or the, or the disc. Um, but that's all you owned, the paper or the tape or the disc. You didn't own the movie. You just had a right to watch the movie. Now it's become clear that that's all you have. Um, and that it's being controlled by the provider of the service. So even if you download a book onto your reading device, um, uh, it's still only the right to read it on the terms provided by that service, or if you stream some music or watch a, watch a movie on a, uh, one of the services that you've mentioned, again, you've just got the right to watch it. You don't have the right to copy it. Um, and you don't certainly own it. Um, and one of the consequences of that is even if you have downloaded content, it is still being controlled by the provider uh, and the, the provider can erase it or change it or whatever. Um, and this is a consequence of the fact that as a reader, as a user, you've never actually had anything other than permission to, um, to consume the content on the terms being set by 
the uh, copyright access provider, in this case, the content creator. Uh, and those terms and conditions are more obvious uh, when they're being exercised electronically than they are when they're being exercised in respect of, of a book or a CD. Because does anybody ever read the first few pages of the book that says this book is sold subject to the condition that it may only be blah? Or does anybody ever read the CD insert, which tells you you only have the right to listen to it, um, or the DVD uh, uh paper uh, brochure, which says, you know, only in certain circumstances can you watch this, uh, whereas that can be policed a bit more by the um, uh, by the electronic delivery. And that's one of the many ways in which the uh, content industries are making clear that they own the content and they're merely giving you permission to consume it on their terms. And that is an entirely a function of copyright because they own the right to decide whether you copy it, whether you publish it, whether you adapt it, whether you view it, and so on. But there's also the question of um, being able, I mean, and, and the, the courts to some degree have, have indicated you should have some rights to move that content around amongst your own machines, for example, and to, uh, to repurpose for fair use and to... Mm -hmm. Um, and there's and there's still this overhanging issue of at what stage does uh, is it allowable that a, a company would also set parameters for technologies that belong to the owner, not to the the company? For example, they weren't in placing restrictions on printers and how printers operated and how they might print a book, for example, um, outside of design and those sort of, um, so, so, so clearly there's, there's, there are, there are a wide range of issues that keep folding into this and that have yes. created the quite fraught situation uh, we have now. One thing to note is that the legislation that sets up copyright, whether it's in the US or the, the EU, even though it provides for extensive rights for the copyright holder, whether that's the original creator or somebody that he or she has transferred it to, like a, a music company or a streaming service or a TV company or whatever, they have extensive rights under the legislation, but there are lots of exceptions to those rights. And uh, the courts have increasingly been assertive in protecting those exceptions. In Canada, they're called user rights, not exceptions to copyright. They're seen as equal rights to the copyright owner's rights, the user rights in those circumstances. And in the US, the most important of these exceptions or user rights is called fair use, as you've described, which is basically a right to make use of copyright material that doesn't have a significant impact on the economic use that is being made of it by the current copyright owner. And the courts have interpreted that quite generously. Uh, in one example, the Betamax example that we've already discussed, that's the perfect example of the courts recognising that private copying, moving the, the data from one device to another, even if it is strictly a copy, because you can't, you're not moving the data from one device to another, you're taking a copy of the data on one device and you're making it on the other device, uh, whether it's, um, you know, shifting between uh, your, your devices, storing it in the cloud so it can go between your devices. Um, the This sort of time shifting or format shifting or um, uh, or data shifting is a fair use. You have the, the right to use it. You should be able to use it on your own devices. Um, this was recognized as a, um, as a matter, uh, as a user right in 1984 in the US Supreme Court. Um, and subsequent courts have interpreted the user rights that, um, that these exceptions allow in very broad terms, as I said, in Canada, but also in the US. So users have a great deal of flexibility around um, non-commercial use of their uh, of the content that they are lawfully licensed to use. Shorthand, they can use their own content. Um, but it's a combination of legislative exceptions and court reading them broadly. In the European Union, these exceptions didn't get recognized until 2000. 
when the European Union introduced its first uh, copyright directive, the Copyright and the Information Society Directive. Um, and that directive is effectively um, a federal act of the European Union, which requires member states to legislate accordingly. It's not like a piece of legislation that takes effect in its own right, which is how we think of legislation. It is legislation that requires action on a national level. Mm. And when Ireland implemented that also in 2000, in the Copyright and Related Rights Act 2000, it specifically allowed for time shifting. So in 2000, you were finally um, lawfully allowed to make a copy of an episode of Columbo to watch later. Uh, but between 1984 and 2000, if you had made a copy of an episode of Columbo to watch later, you were a copyright pirate. Um, the, uh, the same directive allowed member states to um, uh, allow private copying of um, uh, lawfully owned data. So make a, make a tape copy of your vinyl so that you can protect your vinyl and listen on tape, for example, or now... Uh, the equivalent of moving data from one device to another, that that was something that the director in 2000 said member states can do. Ireland didn't do it. Um, to cut ahead in the story, we recommended in our 2011-2013 process that Ireland should. Uh, the government refused to do so. Um, amendments to the legislation were put down that the government rejected. And so still, strictly speaking, if you move um, some of your iTunes from your uh, PC to your mobile device, you are in breach of copyright as a matter of Irish law, even though since 1984, it's been perfectly OK so far as US law is concerned. Uh, and that raises one big philosophical question, which is, do we want the rebalancing of copyright to happen on the go as necessary, sometimes in the courts, uh, sometimes socially? Or do we want it to be a matter of significant lawmaking where the exceptions are always going to be slow, late and incomplete? Mm. OK, um, I, and it's that's a perfect point at which to jump into your role in the uh, to chair a committee of experts who'd take a hard look at Irish copyright and, pro and proposed reforms and, and bring us up to date. And so where do you, you've given a bit of a sense of where we in the EU stood in terms of copyright at that juncture. I don't know if there's anything else you want to give in terms of background of where you started from. Well, we started with the uh, 2000 Directive and the Irish legislation which implemented the directive and consolidated all of the Irish copyright legislation up until then. Um, one of the things that this story that we've been telling so far, it, that one of the things that will be obvious from that is that copyright development is piecemeal. You get legislation, then you get a bit added, you get a bit taken away, you get another reform. That was all dressed down and comprehensively reformed in 1976 in the U.S., um, but it wasn't equivalently dressed down and comprehensively reformed in Europe until 2000. And Ireland uh, was quick at that stage to do the same thing. So we've got a pretty long Copyright Act in 2000. One of the things that it did was it accepted the European reforms, which were basically updating reforms. Uh, but as I said, by 2000, what we've had is the the the, the growth of maximizing copyright by content industries. Uh, and then you had the challenges, the various challenges of the internet. And the two main questions animating the review in 2011 were, were A, whether our copyright rules were internet compatible, broadly speaking. Um, and then secondly, whether those rules were um, uh, capable of encouraging or discouraging innovation. So let's say I've got an idea and I implement it, but it's not a great implementation. Um, and you've got a better way of doing the same thing. Um, does my copyright in my expression of my idea restrict you in using your better version? Um, 
and therefore preventing your downstream innovation. So copyright encourages my first innovation, but discourages your downstream innovation, unless the balance between my protection of copyright and your ability to take advantage of an exception um, uh, allows you to take advantage of the exception. And in our view, uh, just use the, um, uh, the, the home copying example, there were a lot of exceptions in the 2000 directive that Irish legislation didn't implement. Um, some heritage, for example, some culture, some teaching, some, uh, uh, so, so some research. Uh, and all of these things are, we are told, the wellspring of innovation. Um, and our recommendation was all of these exceptions should be, um, uh, since they were permitted by the directive, implemented in Irish law. And the government chose some of them, but not others. But that was our first thing. Um, was it technologically neutral? Was it capable of uh, encouraging innovation? And we suggested a rebalancing uh, so that more of the exceptions could be taken advantage of. But then um, giving with one hand, we needed to balance that by giving with the other as well. So um, allowing some of these technological things that you were talking about, uh, that, that, that were measures that protected copyright, uh, we gave, we recommended giving them a better legislative underpinning, but also a better, uh, uh, engagement for exceptions for users. So that's what we were trying to do. Protect copyright, encourage innovation. So, and one of the ways that we were asked to do that was to look at this US idea of fair use. Um, and we thought that, um, you know, the, the, the argument is that fair use is terrible if you're a part of the, content side, you think fair use is terrible because it encourages downstream users to engage with the content. Um, but if you're a downstream user, it, it allows you to innovate in respect of the content. Um, it isn't always certain that something is a fair use, but um, uh, the courts, as I've said, have interpreted it um, expansively and generously. And we, su we suggested that there was space in Irish law, in European law, to find balances um, uh, reflecting the US balances, safety valves where courts can make decisions where you don't have to wait 20 years for a legislative response. The Irish government did not accept our recommendations in that respect. So that's the big, uh, the, the big failure, in, in, in my view, between the 2013 recommendations and the eventual 2019 implementation. A lot of the exceptions were adopted, but uh, user copying wasn't and fair use wasn't. Okay. Um, for for non-E, I just want to take a step backwards. Um, for non-EU um, audience members, why can, it, could you just describe why something that the EU says doesn't become law automatically in a member state and why the kind of, you know, what are the, the there's always some, or there's usually leeway and, th and things don't have to be transposed directly. So this was a, yeah. can you explain just a little bit about that process? Well, um, we, we saw that, we saw the, the strengths and weaknesses of that process in the implementation of the uh, 2000 European Directive. A directive is, as I said, a piece of federal law at the European level, so it's adopted by the European institutions in Brussels, for which we the equivalent of the federal government in um, Washington, in the US. But it doesn't have direct legal effect in the member states. Most legislation proposed uh, and adopted in Brussels then requires localization because the um, 27 member states have 27 different legal systems um, and how copyright in this example is implemented in each of those systems is different. Uh, and so the directive sets out uh, ends to be achieved um, and high level principles as to how that might happen. But the specific means, the specific legislative proposals um, require local legislation. And the directive usually gives two years for that local legislation to happen. Um, and uh, in 2000, 
we were quick. Um, uh, we actually had legislation on the books before the directive was finally adopted because we were in the process of changing it and we could see what Europe was doing and we simply um, implemented as, as Europe required. Uh, but in 2000, directives tended to say things like member states may provide for an exception relating to private copying, for example. Um, and a lot of the member states took advantage of that may not to introduce uh, some of the exceptions. So mm. the directive sets up three main copyright rights, the, the, the rights to publish, to, to copy and to adapt, and 20 or so copyright exceptions. But the rights were mandatory. The states had to protect those copyright rights. But the exceptions were uh, mm. discretionary. Okay. And we only adapted about half of them, which is why our recommendations in 2013 was uh, adapt, sorry, adopt the other half of them as well. And we adopted most, but not all of them. And let me just give you another example. In the US, um, in uh, 1990, the Supreme Court decided that parody was an aspect of fair use. Ireland didn't get a parody exception until 2019. Mm. So 1990, 2019, 29 years later. So what was the process then? You, you, your report came out in 2013. Is, is it correct that mm -hmm. Ireland did not actually put that into law until 2019? Exactly. Um, quite a gap. Now, this, it is quite a gap, but um, I, I was involved in reform of defamation law 10 years before, where again, there was a six year gap between the publication of the relevant report and the implementation of the relevant legislation. Um, and this is part of what you're saying. You I, have this you have this piecemeal approach that could be very slow on the legislative mm -hmm. side. It is. Yeah. I, I mean, in, in many ways, this is not unusual because the biggest companies who shout the biggest, who have the the biggest um, lobbying footprint, are the ones the government is going to hear. And uh, whilst our report suggested some things for some of those, we went out of our way to create all sorts of different ways for the public to get involved, because we saw that the copyright um, field had eight or ten different sets of users, not just the copyright industries pretending to represent the interests of the starving artist in the garage. Uh, and so we were trying to reach all of the the um, uh, all of the, the those players on that field, the individual copyright creators, the uh, collection societies, the different kinds of monetizers, um, the uh, uh, the internet service providers who increasingly have a, have a very important if peculiar role so far as copyright is concerned, innovators, users, educational heritage institutions, and so on. So there's a whole range of players and we try to reach all of them uh, in, with an awful lot of different methods of uh, online outreach, which 2011 doesn't feel all that long ago, but the first European online consultation uh, on copyright wasn't until the following year. So, you know, we like to think that we were the innovators here and they followed our idea. Uh, but there was lots of out, uh, online outreach. There was lots of just direct ac uh, di direct engagement with um, institutions and bodies and people. Um, uh, so we uh, published a consultation report on the basis of our first set of outreach, which was called Copyright and Innovation. Um, uh, and then we had a second set of outreach on foot of that and then published our own report, our final report, Modernising Copyright in 2013. One of the reasons why reports tend to languish on shelves or just sort of uh, data on, on the cloud somewhere very often is because an implementation process isn't included with it. When you're making legal policy that needs legislation, the implementation process starts with a draft bill. So we proposed draft legislation right from the start. It was part of the proposed recommendations in the consultation paper. We recommend you do X. We recommend you do X by implementing legislation with the following effect. Uh, and so part of our recommendations in the, um, uh, in, in, in the report was this is a bill that does all of the things we want you to do, implement the bill. 
Uh, so basically, one recommendation, do everything. Um, uh, but because of continuing um, controversy about other copyright issues, the government really didn't want to get involved in copyright. And when it did, it did the least controversial set of amendments it could get away with. So it took its time and it did the bare minimum. And where are we now? Uh, the EU came in with some uh, new legislation in 2019, I believe. And then mm -hmm. we, yeah. so uh, under that, we were supposed to adopt it within two years. I'm not, I don't think yeah. we have adopted that. And so can you, can you bring nope. us up to date as where, where are we now? And where might the, is there, is, is there further change, do you think, coming from the EU? And what would, what would you like to see coming from the EU? <laughs> Those are three very different things. Yeah, I did uh, Where we happens. are, what might happen, and what I'd like to see happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, where we are is this. You're absolutely right. Another directive, that is to say, legislation adopted in Brussels telling member states they need to make changes, and you've got two years to make the changes. Uh, it was adopted in June 2019. It was therefore needed to be implemented by June 2021. Nothing is happening has happened. And that is much more usual so far as Ireland is concerned. We're usually slow to late to implement European changes. And we can often get wrapped on the knuckles uh, for doing that. The Commission, which is effectively the, the European bureaucracy, the Department of State equivalent, um, has started to make noises. Only two member states have uh, completed the legislative process. So it started to make noises versus the other 25 saying, do something or else we will take an action in the Court of Justice uh, seeking uh, damages. So that will concentrate the mind. What did that directive do? Let me go back to the point I made earlier. I said internet service providers have a very important, if peculiar, role uh, in the copyright environment. Um, they are the means by which the uh, the content and data are now delivered. Uh, you wouldn't get your Netflix or your Amazon or your or your Spotify if you weren't online and being provided uh, the, the the online access by uh, your service provider. So internet intermediaries have a very important role in allowing the the free flow of uh, of content. Um, in the mid 90s, the worry was that if intermediaries were responsible for the content sloshing through, if the internet is a series of pipes, and if the uh, intermediaries were responsible for the content sloshing through their pipes, then that might discourage the development and growth of the intermediaries. And so in the US in 1998 and 2000, legislation introduced safe harbors, saying that um, provided they had nothing to do with the content, if you host the content, if you hate the, con the content, content, if you were simply the pipe, the conduit of the content, then you're not responsible for the content. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the slightly better known um, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, but 512 is the copyright one. Uh, 230 is the effectively the defamation one. And that immunity for um, internet service providers uh, is a very important part of their business model, is a very important part of why the internet service providers were able to grow and why we've got um, Google, for example, and Facebook and uh, your local ISP, whoever is providing uh, your broadband right now, um, because they're not responsible for what you and I say uh, on this broadcast. And in the European Union in, 2000, in uh, a different piece of legislation, also in 2000, uh, those immunities uh, that I've described in the US were also replicated in the EU. What has happened in recent years is that um, the copyright industries have created a narrative that says that not only have the um, uh, ISPs obtained an advantage by virtue of these safe harbours, they've obtained an, an unfair advantage. And one of the big things that the uh, 2019 directive does is that it limits the ways in which the ISPs can rely on those immunities 
in respect of uh, large amounts of copyright infringing data. Now, they claim they're trying to do something about it. Content ID on, um, on YouTube, for example, is a means of recognizing copyright uh, and trying to prevent infringement. Uh, what the European Union wants to do is to legislate for uh, those kinds of filters across the board, uh, in particular for very large platforms. So that's the first major thing that the directive does. It, it expands protections for, um, for, for legacy content, for legacy industries like, like the press. Um, it tries to balance that with a few additional exceptions around uh, online education, around cultural institutions, and around um, uh, what's called text and data mining. Uh, two things about those. The first is that they're not discretionary, they're mandatory. Uh, so unlike in 2000, where the exceptions were uh, discretionary and most member states only chose a few, at least here, although they're only introducing a few uh, exceptions, they're saying they must be recognized because they are the quid pro quo. Um, but they are all very pale imitations of much broader fair uses that have been recognized in the US. So the, the, the courts in the US continue to uh, balance the rights much better by means of fair use than the legislatures do um, in, in the EU. And how hopeful, what, is, is there anything further coming down oh, yeah. the line? And, and how hopeful are you of, of, of some of these things changing maybe to give the kind, something more similar, something more, uh, with more of the flexibility that you see in the US? Um, the, I was, I wouldn't say hopeful. I certainly wouldn't say optimistic, but I kept an open mind that, if we were to introduce the European directive with full legislation, then uh, we might take advantage of that space to revisit the 2013 recommendations and add those into the legislation so that um, the things that weren't done in 2013, some at least might be capable of being done now, however, the government has announced that it's going to use the equivalent of an executive order um, uh, called a statutory instrument to do this, notwithstanding that it purported to have a consultation process around the implementation. Um, it wasn't a particularly broad uh, consultation process. And at the end of it, they've decided they're going to do the bare minimum by an executive order statutory mm -hmm. instrument rather than open up the whole thing again with legislation. So my open mind has been closed by virtue of that. What would I like to see? Well, I would like to have seen the European Union in this directive adopt some of the flexibilities that US style fair use allows. And there was a strong movement in favour of that. I spent a bit of time uh, in Brussels trying to meet lawmakers to make these kinds of suggestions. I wasn't the only one. I was simply letting them know that there were these Irish proposals. Uh, there were lots of uh, non-governmental organisations making those arguments as a pushback against um, as a pushback against the, the content companies who had their own, uh, their own lobbying effort. Um, the, uh, uh, th there was a piece of, um, data legislation called the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, which went through Brussels five years ago, and it became the most lobbied piece of legislation internationally ever, um, including you know, metrics from, from Washington lobbying. And all the lobbyists who flocked to Brussels for that stayed for the rest of the Brussels digital agenda. And therefore, the big lobbyists that lobbied for industry around the GDPR were continuing to lobby uh, when it came to the directive. Um, and a lot of the really interesting things that could have gone into the directive didn't in exactly the same way as a lot of the really interesting things that could have gone into the 2019 Irish legislation on front of our recommendations also didn't. So what's my view of the future? Well, predictions are difficult, as Yogi Berra probably didn't say, especially about the future. 
Um, I am not sanguine that we will see many more copyright exceptions. The, the tide is flowing very much in favor of maximizing content, maximizing copyright protections, cutting down on exceptions, imposing liabilities on intermediaries. Um, and that's going to make life very difficult for end users who take advantage of exceptions and rely on intermediaries. Um, and I don't see that trend changing anytime soon, sadly. Uh, which is a disappointing note, perhaps, to end on. It also makes me think as well, it, it may uh, present constriction for further innovation as well as these things um, do, where copyright is there to um, protect, protect, but also encourage innovate, further innovation at some point, or ideally, that's what we would want to be there. We want to get that balance right. It sounds like the balance is leaning way towards the um, the strictest interpretations and the narrowest range of exceptions. Um, Owen, oh, thank you so much for joining me today and giving us those personal insights, especially into um, European and Irish level copyright, because I think that's very helpful in understanding how the how the legal sausages get made as ugly as that process may be at times. Um, and to our listeners, for now, it's goodbye from me, Carla Lillington, and the Wald Culture Podcast. And we hope you'll join us for further episodes ahead as we explore these spaces where technology and copyright collide. Thanks very much and goodbye. Goodbye.